Greetings, dear ones. Um, today we are reading from the Wednesday reading from this book, The Last Week, where we're journeying with Jesus toward the cross, heading through uh, Holy Week. The first scripture for Wednesday reading begins with Mark 14, verses 1 through 11. If you have one of these books by chance at your house and are following along, it's page 85 where I'm starting. Listen for the word of the Lord. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon, the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, whenever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. This ends the reading. This chapter goes on. Recall what we said at the start of chapter 2 about Mark's use of frames as a literary device for placing two subjects in dramatic interaction with one another so that readers should use them to interpret each other. There on Monday, the two subjects were the symbolic destruction of the fig tree for not producing fruit and the symbolic destruction of the temple for not producing justice. In other words, the events were in parallel and symmetry. Here on Wednesday, there is another mark and frame but now the two subjects are in opposition and contrast. The structure is like this, incident A, the need for a traitor, incident B, the unnamed woman, and incident A squared, the advent of a traitor. The literary contrast between the framed unit and the framing ones is between believer and traitor, but the depth of that mark and juxtaposition requires an understanding of what each person achieved within the sequence of Mark's story about Jesus. It is, after all, easy to see why betraying Jesus represents the worst action possible. But why does anointing Jesus imply the best? One footnote, and so it often happens when Matthew and Luke are faced with a Markan intercalculation, they simply erase it by running the two frames together without any centrally framed unit between them. For example, Matthew unifies the cursing and weathering of the fig tree as a single incident on Monday. Rather than following Mark, who divided it over Monday and Tuesday to frame the temple incident. Matthew insists that Jesus' command was immediately obeyed and the fig tree withered at once. And when the disciples saw it, they were amazed, saying, How did this fig tree wither at once? In this present case, as you can see from the table, Matthew shows Mark's framing technique, but Luke runs the frames together and omits the section. Those changes confirm, at least indirectly, the deliberate nature of this literary and theological device. This next piece is the need for a traitor. In a tradition that goes back centuries, Christians have most often portrayed the Jewish crowd around Jesus during his last days as rabidly and violently against him. We see it in passion plays, the most famous of which is at Abaramagu in Bavaria. We also see it in the more recent liturgical practice in many churches, in which the congregation plays the part of the crowd as the story of Jesus' trial is read. The congregation chants, crucify him, crucify him. 
It is also central to Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ. What these portrayals fail to ask, however, is this. Why, if the Jewish crowd was so against Jesus, was it necessary to arrest him in the darkness of night with the help of a traitor from among the Jesus followers? Why not arrest him in broad daylight? And why do they need Judas? Indeed, the mark in Jesus himself prompts us to ask precisely those questions. Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. So why arrest him now in this place and in this manner? This is a crucial question, and in answer it, we must look back at Mark's account from Sunday through Wednesday morning. On Sunday, as you recall, Jesus' anti-imperial entry into Jerusalem invoked great enthusiasm. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord in the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Those involved were not identified in any way beyond the vague term, many. We are not told that may begin to wonder how many is many. In any demonstration, how many is many? On Monday, after Jesus cites the text of Jeremiah, the den of robbers, during the temple's symbolic destruction, Mark records this reaction. When the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. We now have a clear distinction between the high priestly authorities who wish to execute Jesus and the whole crowd who are spellbound by his teaching. But of course, since Jesus has been proclaiming the already present kingdom of God against the already present kingdom of Rome, that spellbound crowd is both the reason as well as the deterrent for high priestly action against him. It is neither accurate nor necessary to demonize the family of Annas. It is current representation Caiaphas or other high priestly families to understand what is happening. The concern of those collaborative leaders is fairly stated in John 11:48. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. And we might add, either crowds or Romans, or both, will destroy them. Even apart from the content of any message of Jesus, subversive of Roman law and order, however nonviolent it may have been, the very presence of enthusiastic crowds listening to whatever it was he said would have been deemed dangerous at any time, but especially at Passover. The only reason given to Josephus for Antipas's execution of John the Baptizer in his view, in his Jewish antiquities, is not the content of John's message, but the size of John's crowd. When others, too, joined the crowds about him, because they were aroused to the highest degree by his sermons, Herod became alarmed. Eloquence that had so great an effect on mankind might lead to some form of sedition, for it looked as if they would be guided by John in everything that they did. In any case, to return to Mark's story, by Monday, the Jewish religious authorities want to have Jesus executed, but are deterred from action because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. That is after, and because of, those two prophetic symbolic actions. First, his entrance into Jerusalem to establish God's non-violence against imperial domination. And second, his entrance into the temple to establish God's justice against high priestly collaboration. On Tuesday, that preceding contrast between the Jewish authorities and the Jewish crowd is repeated three times, in case we may have missed it. First, after Jesus interrogated the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders concerning John the baptizer, they were unable to answer negatively because they were afraid of the crowd, for all regarded John as truly a prophet. The crowd stands with both John and Jesus against their own religious authorities, who oppose them both. 
Next, Jesus tells the parable of the wicked tenants who murder the vineyard's owner, owner's son. And when they realized that he had told this parable against him, they wanted to arrest him. But they feared the crowd, so they left him and went away. Finally, Jesus challenges the scribes on how the Messiah can be both David's son and David's Lord at the same time, and the large crowd was listening to him with delight. To see Mark's emphasis on Jesus as protected by the supporting crowd from action by the threatening authorities, it is necessary to understand the narrative logic of Wednesday morning. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they had said, not during the festival or there may be a riot among the people. In effect, the high priestly authorities give up. They cannot arrest Jesus during the festival and after it, he will be gone. They give up unless, of course, they can learn where he is apart from the crowd, arrest him apart from the crowd, and execute him before the crowd knows what's happening. Stealth is the last chance left. That leaves 14.2 hanging for the arrival of Judas, the stealthy one in 14.10. Moving a little bit ahead to page 91. For us, Lent is a transformative journey in time from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday. For Mark, Lent was a transformative journey in space from Caesarea Philippi to Jerusalem. During that journey in Mark's story, Jesus tried to prepare his disciples for what would happen to him when he demonstrated against Roman imperial power concerning its voice, its violence and against Jewish high priestly authority concerning its injustice. Also, and even more important, Jesus attempted to prepare them for their individual and communal participation in that death and resurrection, that end as beginning. But as we see Peter, James, and John, then the twelve as a group, and finally Judas, all fail tragically, but not irrevocably, except for Judas, to accept their destiny alongside Jesus. We emphasize and cannot emphasize enough one point about this very prominent theme in Mark, his story of failed discipleship and his warning gift to all who ever heard and read this narrative. We must think of Lent today as a pentinal season because we know that, like those first disciples, we would like to avoid the implications of this journey with Jesus. We would like it, its Holy Week conclusion to be about the interior rather than the exterior life, about heaven rather than earth, about the future rather than the present, and above all else about religion safely and securely quarantined from politics. Confronting violent political power and unjust religious collaboration is dangerous in most times and most places. First century and 21st century alike, here then is how Marx warning builds up negatively towards the first person who positively believed Jesus's message. That unnamed woman with her eternal alabaster jar of ointment. Very early in his story, Mark records that Jesus went up to the mountain and called to him those whom he wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles to be with him, and to be sent out to proclaim the message. So he appointed the 12. But there is a ferocious ambiguity in Mark's account of that group's relationship with Jesus. On the one hand, they are regularly taken aside for special instruction. In 928, for example, when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately about their inability to exercise a demon. And in 1010, in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter of no divorce. In 410, however, this separate group seems at least fleetingly larger than the 12. When he was alone, those who were around him, along with the 12, asked about the parables. On the other hand, this special and separate instruction seems to be a dismal failure, seems, if anything, to increase their failure and even their responsibility for it. Thus Mark records of the disciples that their hearts were hardened, and Jesus upbraids them with this battery of accus accusatory questions, do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? 
Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? So for general background, to be the 12 apostles or disciples in Mark's story is to fail Jesus badly. And all of that becomes very, very specific on their Lenten journey with Jesus from Caesarea Philippi to Jerusalem. Indeed, in case we might miss what is already obvious enough internally, Mark frames that journey externally with the healing of a blind man at Bethsaida in Galilee before it began, and again in Jericho of Judea as it ends. Between those frames of blindness, Mark focuses the failed discipleship of the Twelve around three prophetic warnings of his death and resurrection given to them by Jesus. In what follows, watch always for this structure, prophecy by Jesus, reaction by the Twelve, and response by Jesus. I'm going to skip way ahead to page 101. Atonement. Substitution or participation? You ready for this? This is complicated. It is probably fair to say that substitutionary atonement is the only way that many or even most contemporary Christians understand faith in the sacrificial and salvific death of Jesus. That theological interpretation asserts that God has been deeply offended and dishonored by human sin, and two, no amount of infinite human punishment can atone for that infinite divine offense, and three, God sent his own divine son to accept death as punishment for our sins in our place, and therefore four, God's forgiveness is now freely available for all repentant sinners. It is not just that Jesus offered his life in atonement for sin, but that God demanded it as a condition for our forgiveness. The basic and controlling metaphor for that understanding of God's design is our own experience of a responsible human judge who, no matter how loving, cannot legitimately or val validly walk into her courtroom, clear the docket of all offenders by anticipatory forgiveness. The doctrine of vicarious or substitutionary atonement begs, of course, the question of whether God must or should be seen as a human judge writ large and absolute. That is surely not the only and maybe not the best metaphor for God. What about the metaphor, for example, in which God is fundamentally parent, father if you prefer, or mother, rather than judge? As such, and indeed as the Bible repeatedly asserts, God's punishing forgiveness has always been, is now and ever will be, freely available to any repentant sinner at any place, at any time. I'll say it again. God's unpunishing forgiveness has always been, is now and ever will be, freely available to any repentant sinner at any place, at any time. But how do you then move beyond forgiveness to establish a positive union with God as a loving parent. Since Jesus is for Christians the revelation, the image, and the best vision possible of that God, it is only by participation in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that such salvific one at one atonement, at one -ment is possible. Go back now and read again those three prophecies, reactions, and responses that are in Mark 8, 31, 9, 1, 9, 31 through 37, and 10, 33 through 45, in light of that choice between God as judge or as parent, that choice between substitution by Jesus for us or participation by us in Jesus. Notice above how repeatedly Mark has Jesus insists that Peter, James, and John, the Twelve, and all of his followers on the way from Caesarea Philippi to Jerusalem must pass with him through death to a resurrected life, whose content and style was spelled out relentlessly against their refusals to accept it. For Mark, it is about the participation with Jesus and not the substitution by Jesus. Mark has those followers recognize enough of that challenge 
but they change the subject and avoid the issue every time. To be fair to them, however, they still stay with Jesus. And every year, our Lent asks us to repent, change, and participate in that transition with Jesus. But to do so, as we know, would be to negotiate the normalcy of civilization's lust for domination and to deny the legitimacy of what lords and kings have always been and what nations and empires have always done. But wait a minute. What about that climatic conclusion in Mark 10:45, which states that the Son of Man may came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve? Let me start over. What about that climatic conclusion in Mark 10:45, which states that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life in ransom for many? Does that metaphor of ransom or redemption not indicate substitutionary atonement? Possibly, if taken as an isolated saying, but certainly not in its marking context of the journey from Caesarea Philippi to Jerusalem. The Greek word translated ransom is lutron, which means the payment to an owner for a slave's freedom, or a captive's ransom. It is not used in the Greek of the Hebrew Bible for anything like vicarious satisfaction or vicarious atonement to God for sin. A typical usage is in the connection with Cyrus, the 6th century Persian emperor, who after conquering Babylon, freed and sent home those Jews taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And Cyrus would not even demand any ram ransom for their redemption, according to Isaiah. In that text from Isaiah, the Greek word for price is lutron or ransom, Cyrus will not free them. He will not demand any ransom in return. How does Mark think Jesus' death is ransom? The Mark in Jesus has been insisting on the how ever since Caesarea Philippi, to the Twelve in particular, but also to all others as well. It is not by Jesus substituting for them, but how they're participating in Jesus. They must pass through death to see a new life here below upon this earth. And they can already see what that transformed life is like in Jesus himself. I'll move forward a little bit. We're on page 105. We're going to read about the motive of Judas. Mark gives absolutely no hint of Judas's motive in betraying Jesus. He simply records it along with his response from the chief priests. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. Mark, by the way, does not say that Judas did it for money, simply that they promised him some. The other gospels, however, let alone later Christian imagination, were not content to leave the story there. Matthew retells Mark 14, 11 by saying, when Judas went to the high priests, he asked them, what will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. And since he did it for money, they had to pay him up front. That allows Matthew to conclude the story of Judas in 27, 3, verses, or 27, 3 through 10. And to connect that sum of 30 pieces of silver with Zechariah eleven twelve. John goes even further in explaining Judas's motivation. On a theological level, According to John, he was either a devil or at least under diabolical influence. But Jesus always knew what Judas would do. Did I not choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, for he, though one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Next, during that unnamed woman's anointing at Bethany, the protest does not come from a vague sum, as in Mark 14, but specifically from Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him. And John explains this protest and this parenthetical comment. He said this is not because he cared about the poor or because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Finally, on the night of Jesus' arrest, John mentions the devil twice in connection with Judas. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, do quickly what you are going to do. 
All of that is simply standard imagination. Judas did it for the money. Judas, Judas did it because he was a thief and so forth. Scholars and novelists have added several other reasons. For example, Judas had become convinced that nonviolent resistance would not work and was ultimately foolish. Or again, he became afraid that he would be arrested with Jesus, and the best solution was to betray Jesus and save himself. But Mark's emphasis is not on Judas's motive, whatever it was, but on Judas's membership in the Twelve. Notice how he uses it almost like a title every time he mentions Judas. After 3.19, he says, Judas, one of the twelve. Just in case we might ever forget it. Judas's identity among the twelve, not Judas's motivation for betraying Jesus, is Mark's emphasis. His betrayal is simply the worst example of how those closest to Jesus failed him dismally in Jerusalem. The traitor has entered into an argument with those who collaborate with imperial rule. And so, Wednesday ends, and the plot has been set in motion. Amen.